turn if you would to the first book of Moses. The first book of Moses. Chapter number one. So it just seems no matter what the uh, no matter what the topic we come to, uh, it's rather remarkable. We keep coming back to the beginning, right? Back to Genesis, and, and that's really no surprise. Uh, Genesis, Bereshit, I mean, it's the foundation for the Torah. The Torah is the very foundation of your entire Bible, so it's not really all that surprising. It's where God starts laying the foundation, right? It's Genesis, so we're going to get back into Genesis again. And uh, eventually, later on, I want to take you into uh, John chapter 4, So, but we'll, uh, we'll do that, you know, in a little bit. But uh, as we're really picking up where we left off last week, I think you'll agree with me, and it's been actually been since the fall in the garden. It's been going on for thousands of years, righteousness, everything that God wants, righteousness, holiness, goodness, cleanliness, it's all under attack. It's what God wanted in the garden. The serpent came in and disrupted everything. He continues to disrupt things. And so righteousness is under attack. Uh, the scriptures, our Bible, is under attack. Righteousness is under attack. Uh, congregations, churches, assemblies, under attack. Righteousness under attack. Your marriage. Your family, your home, your children, grandchildren, under attack. Righteousness is under attack. And what is really appalling is, of all things, God is under attack. It's almost shocking when you really think about it. It's, it's rather preposterous, but it's true. God is under attack. He's under attack from many, many different avenues, many different ways, from atheistic uh, university professors and the media, social media, the culture, entertainment, movies, television, music, right? Uh, evolutionists, scientists, politicians from the federal, state, local level, from every which way God is under attack. God's word is under attack. It's not really surprising. Uh, so many different ways that God is being attacked. Uh, but there's one group in particular where we're focusing on in, in this volume. And the group that has been attacking God, at least in this country, but it's been going on for many, many years. But the one group that has been attacking God, they've been attacking God for five full decades and into the sixth. And that movement, that group is the feminist movement. And it has been attacking God rather successfully for five full decades. When we go to the scriptures, the foundation of our faith, we look for examples. When we look and we see the greatest women that we have in the scriptures. Not one of them is a vice president. Not one of them is, is a governor or a mayor or a councilwoman. Not one of them has got her own law practice. Not one of them has her own medical practice. Not one of them is a university professor. Not one of them is a CEO of a company. No, the greatest women that we have, as far as, as examples go in our Bible, that God has preserved for us, the greatest women we have were wives. Wives and mothers. The greatest women, wives and mothers. And so the feminist movement has come along. 
And what the feminist movement has done is it has been incredibly successful in influencing the culture and through the years getting women, many women, millions of women, to abandon the divinely ordained roles which God has given you. Those roles and the responsibilities that God himself has given you. And the feminist movement comes along and has been very successful in coercing you to disregard them. Take what God would really want for you and from you and throw them away. Abandon them. The very responsibilities of being a wife and being a mother. And so in essence, not only disregard and abandon the role that God has for you and the responsibilities as being a wife and a mother that God has for you, but actually have you turn on God and attack God. And some don't even know it. It sounds crazy. It sounds ludicrous. And yet the feminist movement hates God. Hates God. Now you may ask at this point, how? How does this feminist movement attack God? Well, simply put, the feminist movement will take God's word and distort it. Twisted, distorted, disregarded. Why? Why is this feminist movement so bent on manipulating God's word, nullifying God's word, disregarding it? Why? Ladies, because it is only in God's word, it is only in your Bible that you, as God's creation, woman, his daughter. It is only in the scriptures where you can find God's intended design for you. That's it. It's not in the culture. It's not in media. What God wants for you, that role, a divinely ordained role, his design for you, it is in that book. So we must take that book and nullify it, manipulate it, twist it, distort it. And so through the years, the Bible has been disregarded and nullified. So you see, you go ahead, you take the word, you take your faith, you nullify it, you manipulate it, you disregard it. And then what the culture does is now that that's out of the way, we're going to take you, ladies, and we're going to shape you. And we've got a new role for you. And we have new responsibilities for you that have nothing to do with God's word. As Eve said, the serpent deceived me. And there are many millions that have been deceived. Victimization. It is at the heart of Marxism. You are a victim, ladies. You're a victim. You've been oppressed. It's time. Time to rise up against the bourgeois. Take your proper place. And so it is very important for us to return to the foundation of our scriptures, Genesis. We go back to the beginning. And we and we're going to do the best we can. What is God's design? What is his role? What is his intention for you? And why? Why has this feminist movement become such a cancer that attacks his word and in essence attacks God? Back to the beginning. Genesis 1, beginning of verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule. And let them rule. Them rule. 
over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Father, we come before you thanking you for preserving this precious book. It has been under such severe attack, such severe attack for so long, and yet you remain faithful and true. We still have it. We always will. It is forever settled in heaven. And so, Lord, let us delve back into your word, and it is a difficult message. We are swimming against the current. It, it, this message, I know it is going to be like salt in a wound for many. But I pray, Lord, that by your spirit, that spirit would rule and overrule in our minds and in our hearts to truly find out what you have for us. And may we be, as husbands and wives, everything that you would want us to be. For your glory, for your honor, and for your name's sake, we come before you, Lord. Amen. So... The first thing we have to understand is that in the beginning, God created them, male and female. He created them, and he created them equal, equal as man, as woman, male, female. We are equal. We are equal. It's not as if God took the man and gave the man more of the image of God than he did the woman, okay? Here, you get 100% of my image, man, and you, sorry, you get the consolation prize, right? No, equal, equal. He created them. And so as spiritual beings who pray and who worship and who serve God, we are in every way equal. Don't ever forget that. We are equal. There are There is equality of the sexes, male, female. As spiritual beings, we are equals. Um, we're dealing with, well, it's a very well-known term. We keep hearing it in the news a lot, a variant, right? Uh, now we have off of COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-2, we have a variant. We have a Delta Variant. Thankfully, it's very contagious, not nearly as dangerous as the one that we've had to deal with before. That's a good thing, but it's still out there, and it's a variant. Okay, There is a variant that has come off of the feminist movement. The feminist movement takes male, takes female, takes the role of each, takes the responsibilities of each, and blurs them. Blurs them takes God's word and just nullifies it. And so the man and the woman role responsibilities are blurred. The variant that has come off of the feminist movement is now the transgender movement. That's a variant. And so once again, the transgender movement comes along, takes male, takes female. Instead of blurring the role and the responsibilities, it blurs male and female biologically. Biologically. So. The psychology of it overrules the biology, and everything is blurred. Think about it. So what I perceive, what I what I perceive overrules what is actual. Right? Man looks like a man, sounds like a man, has the genitalia of a man, everything about a man, but in the mind, psychologically speaking, I'm something else. And therefore, I now, you are now mandated to accept what is going on up in here. It's almost as ridiculous as saying, okay, regardless of what you have ever learned, right, about this ball that we're spinning on, that we're living on, this is not Earth. In my mind, it is Saturn. And so all of you must accept the fact that it's Saturn because it's up in my mind. So regardless of what you know and what you've been taught, you must accept what I believe or psychologically I, I approve of is that this planet is Saturn and Earth is somewhere else. It's ludicrous. It's a variant. But back to Genesis. By the time you get to Genesis 2, we have some more detail as far as the roles go 
and the responsibilities go. Notice if you will, again, we are equals, but we were not created, the man and the woman, the woman was not created at the same time as the man. Okay? God did not create them at the same time. He created them, yes, not at the same time, nor do they have the same responsibilities. Verse 18, Genesis 2, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And I'll get to that English word helper in a little bit. But notice, if you will, by this point in history, Genesis 2, verse 18, everything in God's creation is perfect. Perfect. Yet the situation that the man is in is not a good situation. Even though everything is perfect. Verse 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Notice. He, God, brings her, woman, to the man. God creates woman and brings woman to the man. And so woman now is a special gift to the man. Spiritual equals, same ability to worship and pray and love and serve, same, same worth, same value. She is a gift to him. Her role is not the same as his. Her responsibilities are not the same as his. The woman is the man's azer. Azer. In the English, helper. Better yet, better translation, a corresponding strength. A corresponding strength. And where you look for that word elsewhere in the scriptures, it's usually uh, in regards to a relationship of service to another. Man, woman, equals, different roles, different responsibilities. The woman who is equal with the man has a role and she has responsibilities. She is to submit to him. He has the authority. She does not. She is to be his wife. She is to be the mother of his children. Those, that is her role. Those are her responsibilities. What is happening? As I'm getting these words out of my mouth, it is starting to feel like salt. For some of you ladies, it is salt that is getting into a wound and it's starting to burn. Because the message, even though it's coming out of God's word, it's burning. There's a burn there. And the reason why there's a burn is because this society and this culture is so far removed from the biblical standard. Feminism has been so entrenched into this society and into this culture that even a message coming straight out of God's word, you're getting a little perturbed. You're getting a little upset with it. And it's coming out of God's word. Because feminism is so entrenched and we're so far removed. And so even though the message that I'm giving you is coming out of God's word, it sounds chauvinistic. It sounds sexist. The feminist movement comes along after God has given woman the role and here are your responsibilities. Divinely ordained by God. The feminist movement comes along and says, no, 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 no. We take all of what God has said 
and all that God desires, and we throw them in the trash. Because, ladies, you're a victim. You are a victim, and you've been victimized for many, many years by those men. And we are going to shape a different role and different responsibilities for you. Like the old Virginia Slims billboard, you've come a long way, baby. There's a whole new world out there. Who wants to be cooped up in the house? Sue Bolin is a writer, speaker for Probe Ministry. She wrote this actually several decades ago. I wonder what her opinion is now. Let me read to you this excerpt from an essay that she wrote. Quote, at its inception, the feminist movement, accompanied by the sexual revolution, made a series of enticing, exciting promises to women. These promises sounded good, so good, that many women deserted their men and their children or rejected the entire notion of marriage and family in pursuit of themselves and a career. These pursuits, which emphasize self-sufficiency and individualism, were supposed to enhance a woman's quality of life and improve her options, as well as her relations with men. Now a decade or so later, women have had to face the fact that in many ways, feminism and liberation made promises that could not be delivered. So the, res the role given to the man, the role given to the woman, the responsibilities of the man, the responsibilities of the woman were given to both of them prior to the curse, prior to the fall. Again, equals, we are still equals, still equals, our value to God, the same, our worth as man and woman to God, the same spirituality before God exactly the same exactly the same nothing has changed thousands of years later and nothing has changed even in the scriptures they didn't change Exodus 21 15 he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death two verses later he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Same value, same worth, same spirituality. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. God, throughout his word, has never, ever viewed woman as having less value or less worth than the man. The culture has changed, but not God. We are absolute equals equals man woman husband wife father mother equals different roles different responsibilities throughout the scriptures women have been viewed as equals as far as god is concerned that being the case you will not see women as leaders Now, there's a name that just popped into your head, and we'll get to her in a second. But when you look at Miriam, Miriam, godly woman, Miriam was a prophetess. Miriam uh, uh, led the women in dancing. So godly. You never see Miriam leading with Moses. And you certainly didn't see her leading Moses. Moses was in charge. You can bet your bottom dollar on that one. He was in charge. He was the leader. She was not. Now, there is a name that has popped up. As soon as I said, you will never see a woman as a leader. There's one name that popped up, and I know what it is. It starts with D and ends with Ebra. So let's talk about Deborah. I'm glad you brought her up. Judges chapter 4. Let's talk about Deborah. Deborah you find in the book of Judges. And she's a judge. And God made her a judge. In the book of Judges. In the book where it says that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. 
So yes, we have Deborah as a judge, and God put her as a judge. That is the exception, not the rule. That is the exception, not the rule. Deborah as a judge is not something to applaud. That's an embarrassment. Why is it embarrassment? Because God couldn't find a man to do the job. God couldn't find a man to do a job. I'm looking for a man and I can't find one. Deborah, you got it. When God allows women to run the show and lead, that is not something to applaud. That's something to be embarrassed about. And you see that throughout the scriptures. Isaiah 3 verse 12. Listen to God's words. Oh my people, their oppressors are children and women rule over them. Oh my people, those who guide you, lead you astray and confuse the direction of your paths. He's talking about a wayward people. A wayward people that were not walking with him. When you see women running the show and leading, that is not something to applaud. That's an indictment. That's an embarrassment because God can't find a man. That is a judgment on a sinful nation and it always has been. Folks, I, again, it's going to seem like salt in a wound just to show you how far we have fallen as a nation, as a godly nation. Several months ago, in his State of the Union address, our president, over his left-hand shoulder, he had Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, over his right-hand shoulder, Kamala Harris, Vice President, and he said, for the first time in American history, we have two women sitting back there. That's an embarrassment. That's atrocious. There are no godly men in this country that can lead. That's what that is. That's not something to applaud. That's an indictment. People say, when do you expect God's judgment to fall? All you had to do was look. It's already started. But again, the feminist movement has so entrenched into our culture that that's, a, that's something to applaud when in fact we ought to be ashamed. You do not see, as far as his design, women leading. You do not see women in the tribe of Judah ever be elevated to be a king. You do not see any woman in the tribe of Levi who was ever assigned to be a priest in the tabernacle or the temple. Every book of your Bible, even though two are named after women, every book in your Bible was written by a man. So again, the culture, the culture may say this is permissible. God's word does not. It never has. Never has. There is a reason that you are seeing. At one point, it was the greatest, most powerful nation on the planet. And you are seeing it day by day by day getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And folks, when it falls, when this thing falls, who becomes the police in the bad neighborhood? Who, what nation stands up to China? Hmm? When this one falls, No godly men. Can't find godly men. I was in a conversation with my father. My father came to this country. He was 17 years old. He came, he told me, I had clothes on my back and a suitcase. That's all he had. Came to this country, he was 17. Didn't understand the language, all he knew was German. He learned the language. He joined the army after that. Became a citizen, by the way. He came in through Ellis Island, became a citizen. He joined the army. Served in the army. He went to work. He told me, son, 
I've never asked for anything from anybody. All I've ever asked for is a chance. That's it. And I said, Ben, <laughs> he, said, he told me, this is not the America that I came to. And I said, it is sad. When you really truly think the last godly president that we had, a man who knew the Bible, who feared God, a man who was upstanding, who respected other people, and who demanded respect, who treated people honorably, who you could trust, who wasn't a liar, who wasn't uh, somebody who, who was a, a belligerent, or any of those things. I said, when you really look back, the last president we, could, we had, where you could say, man, that's an example of a true godly man in the White House, I said, with Ronald Reagan. That's 40 years ago. And he said, you're right. It's been that long. We can't get a godly man in the White House. We got adulterers, we got communists, we got liars, we've got uh, uh, people with four tongues, we've got all of this, we've had all this trash. Can't get a godly man. Can't find one. And even if we did, he'll never get elected. The culture, the culture. I want you to see, we're gonna to go to John chapter four now. I want you to see what is Yeshua's response to the culture? Because it's not as if he didn't have issues with culture. So I want you to see in John chapter four, how did Yeshua respond to the culture? How did Yeshua respond to women? Because remember in that first century, women in that culture, ancient Near East, they were viewed as possessions. That's not how Yeshua treated them. On the contrary, when you look really throughout the Gospels, he's talking about women in his parables, right? He's got them traveling along as disciples, right? They're working in the ministry with him. He allowed them to touch him, right? So he, he crosses a number of cultural barriers at the time and shows the utmost respect for women in a culture where you did not show respect for women. So I want you to see with your own eyes, John chapter 4, it is an interesting altercation. Now, we can get into the soteriology of this thing, but I want you to look at the culture. The culture. John chapter 4, beginning of verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Yeshua was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Yeshua himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. Okay. First off, Jewish people didn't pass through Samaria. <laughs> that was one area you just did not go. It's kind of like Jewish people not going through Iran today. I mean, it's just, you don't do that. The Jewish people, the Samaritan people, weren't exactly on each other's Hanukkah card list. All right, they did not get along. It's like oil and water. Yet, he goes through Samaria. So that's, that's one cultural barrier that he jumps over, right? That's not going to stop him. The only reason why he's going through Samaria, it's not like, it, well, it's a shortcut. No, he's on a mission. He's on a mission. Culture means nothing to him. Watch this, verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob kept to, or gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Yeshua, being weary from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Why would John say it's the sixth hour? Big deal, right? Not a very important detail, is it? It's a very important detail. Okay. Back then, you've got the day started at 6 a.m. The evening started at 6 p.m. So if we're at the sixth hour, what time of the day is it? Noon. Noon. It's the sixth hour, so it's noon. High noon. High noon. When the sun is at its hottest. Verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Stop. <laughs> She's drawing water at noon. High noon. When the sun is at its hottest. No. That never happened. It was given 
in that culture, it was a woman's responsibility, one of her responsibilities, one of her chores, to go and draw water for their house, whether it was for bathing, whether it was cooking, but you always, the women would always go break of day, early in the morning, when it was the coolest. You don't go at noon. The other thing you need to know, which is interesting, is that in this culture, when the woman, when women would go to the well to draw water at the break of day, that was their little hangout. That was their little get together. It was, it was Twitter, it was Facebook, it was Instagram, it was WhatsApp, it was, it was gossip time. We're gonna get together and we're just gonna gossip about this and your husband did this and my husband did this, and you don't know. And they would gather around. They gathered around at the well. That was Twitter time for them. This woman's not there, okay? So, continuing, Yeshua said to her, give me a drink, okay? We've got multiple problems. <laughs> we got a Jewish individual going through Samaria, that doesn't happen. We've got a woman drawing water at the sixth hour, that doesn't happen. And now we've got Yeshua, who is a Jewish individual, a man, single man, talking with a woman, in public, without anybody else around. Multiple cultural barriers. He is jumping over. He's just knocking them down. Men did not talk with women, especially if it wasn't your wife, out alone in public. That never happened. And fellas, that's a good uh, uh, lesson to learn even for yourself. Do not find yourself with a woman that is not your wife alone, unless it's your daughter or granddaughter, all by yourself with a woman somewhere. All right, try and avoid those situations. Okay, so he's crossing multiple barriers, could care less about the culture. He's about the Father's work. Continuing, verse 8, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Of course, of course, they probably looked at him and said, are you kidding? Can't we do something door, DoorDash or Uber Eats or, he says, no, 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 I need you to go here. Here's my American Express, go into the city. He gets them out of the way because this conversation has to take place and the conversation doesn't take place unless they're gone. He got them out of the way, okay, go on. Verse nine, therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, Ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman. And then John says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Notice John the Apostle is telling you now, the Samaritan woman, I thought we already knew this. Didn't he say before, just a couple verses or so earlier, a woman from Samaria. So now he comes back with the Samaritan woman. Why? Whenever you see repetition, that's an important detail. Okay? That's something the author does not want you to forget. Ruth the Moabitess. Ruth the Moabitess. Ruth the Moabitess, the Moabite, over and over again. You see it. Why? Important detail. She never stopped who she was. She was born a Moabitess. She got saved. She died a Moabitess. Doesn't stop being who she was. So this Samaritan woman, that's an important detail. She asked him, you want to drink of water from me? Physical question. Verse 10, Yeshua answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Ah, she asked him a physical question. He responds with a spiritual answer. Is he weary? Yes. Is he tired? Is he thirsty? Yes, it's noon, goodness. And yet, the water is of no concern to him. He is on a mission, and he has crossed a number of cultural barriers already because he sees a woman and he sees a soul. Verse 11, she said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? who gave us the well and drank it of himself and his sons and his cattle, our father Jacob. So she understands we may not be on each other's Hanukkah card list, 
but were related. The Samaritans and the Jewish people were related. If you go back, when God brought the Syrians into the north, northern kingdom, wiped them out, okay? What the Assyrians would do is that they would incorporate their men to go mingle with that country's women. And they would incorporate their women to go in, mingle with that country's men. And so there was a lot of mingling going on. And when the Assyrian men started mingling with the Jewish or the Hebrew women, and the Assyrian women were mingling with the Hebrew men, you had a race called the Samaritans. And to this day, here in this first century, the Jewish people hated the Samaritans, even though they were related, even though they're related. So you had these two camps that are at odds with one another, yet she realizes and she recognizes, guess what, we are related. Mind, keep, keep in mind as well, the Samaritans accepted the Torah of Moses, all five books. They did not accept anything else in the Tanakh. Okay? Important. So we got cultural differences, which he could care less about. Verse 13, Yeshua answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. So sweetheart, keep coming back to this physical water and what I'm trying to tell you is I have something that is far more special and far more meaningful and far and, and eternal there's something that you can't possibly give me I can give it to you you can't give it to me verse 15 the woman said to him it's like tennis going on right back and forth sir give me this water so she's still in the physical so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. Oh. Oh, she let the cat out of the bag. We've been wondering, wait a minute, why would this woman not go with the other women in the morning? She goes at high noon all by herself. Why would she go and do something like that? And now we come to find out she doesn't even want to go. She does not want to be there. She goes to the well because she has to. She has to get water. But she avoids the other women now. I don't want to come here. So I don't have to come all this way. So now we might not all know all the details, but there is something about her past and there's something about her life. She wants to avoid them. She wants to avoid the gossipers and the talebearers, right? To the point where she will go at noon to get the water. Ah, so he seizes on the opportunity. Because she just cracked the door open. 16. He said to her, go call your husband and come here. So in other words, go get him. I'll wait. In the heat, but I'll wait. Testing. Verse 17. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Yeshua said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Oh, so now we've got a little bit more detail. Why she's not going early in the morning. She's avoiding all of these other women because she's gone through five husbands and she's living with a man now. Why has she gone through five husbands? We don't know. John doesn't tell us. Although I'm gonna throw some theories at you. It could be one of these theories, could be none of them. Number one, remember the culture. Women were possessions. You could divorce them like that. Greco-Roman world, gone. Just pick another one. Want a newer model, what have you, right? Something younger, something, something faster, whatever it may be the case. Get a newer model. So women were went through the divorce process numerous times. Is that it? Is there something physically wrong with her? Where these men keep dumping her? Don't know. We have no idea. If, and it's a possibility, 
although a slim one. If she's had five husbands and they all passed, like let's say she's a widow, okay. And keep in mind, men did not live nearly as long then as they do now. Medical procedures and, and modern science and everything, men live 70s and 80s and not back then. A number of men would die in their 40s or 50s. Okay. So it wasn't uncommon to have widows. But if she kept having men dying on her, the culture, the culture of the ancient Near East would look at somebody like that and say, you're a witch. Like you're involved in the occult and your men keep dying on you. Is that it? Have no idea. But all of those are in play. At any rate, verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Yeshua said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. She injects race into it. She injects race into this conversation. Yeshua wants to keep the conversation on the spiritual, but he's not going to back down from this. And so he responds in verse 22, you, in other words, you Samaritans. So all, all this time, culture hasn't had anything to do with our conversation, but since you keep bringing it up, fine. You, you Samaritans, you worship what you do not know. We, Hebrew kindred, we, we worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. Again, we can get into the soteriology of that passage and it, it's phenomenal. What I wanted you to see is the culture. The culture. How did he respond? How did he react? How did he treat women? Even women that culturally speaking, he wasn't supposed to treat right. And he treated her with compassion, and he, he treated her with respect. And believe me, in that culture, with her background, there was no man, Samaritan or Hebrew, who ever treated her that way before. No man. Utmost respect. He knows this woman, we may have so many differences, so many differences, and yet there's value. She has value. She has worth. There is spirituality there. There's potential. It's been like that. It is like that throughout the scriptures. You get to Paul's epistles. You get to Peter's epistles. There's always, always, always high regard for women. Always. Mind you, the role never changed. The responsibilities never changed. Women throughout submit to your husbands. Respect them. Submit to your husband. Husbands, love your wives sacrificially. Love your wives sacrificially. Ladies, submit to his authority. Equals. Equals, equals. Same worth, same value, same spirituality. Different roles. Different roles. Submit to his authority. It's an authority that was not given to you. Husbands, Love your wives. Watch over them. Protect them. It's a special, a special gift that God has given you. So from the garden, we're talking thousands of years, and nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. In a relationship where both parties, man, woman, husband, wife, equals, equals, but the husband is to always be the leader. Always. And this is a challenge. It's a challenge. Because what God does, it's a challenge for believing couples. Because God, in his sovereign way, he takes man who he has saved and redeemed, right? And, and a husband has God's word and he's got God's Holy Spirit. And he takes the woman, right? Saved, redeemed, 
She has a copy of God's word. She has the uh, uh, Holy Spirit. And guess what God does? I'm going to put these two together with all of their shortcomings, their differences, sin nature, all of these things. His curse, her curse. We're going to put, it, we're going to put the, both of them under the same roof. Ah. You know, like one guy said, it's like, like taking two potatoes. You know what marriage is? Take, you take a potato over here and you skin it. And you skin it alive and you throw it in the pot. And then you take the other potato over here and you skin it and you skin it and you throw it in the pot. And then you go ahead and you stick it in boiling water. And you let them boil it. And the water is hot. And they get together. And then you drain, drain out the, all that boiling water. And now you got two potatoes in there. And guess what you do? You just smash them up. It's a matter of, and now you don't have two potatoes anymore. You just got mashed potatoes. That's marriage. Those of you, maybe young fella, congratulations, that's marriage, right? One big lump of mashed potatoes. But that's what God does. And he sticks them underneath the same roof and says, guess what? This is going to be day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year of compromise. It's going to be compromise. It's going to be work. It's not going to be easy. But I want you to do this because you're going to bring me glory. It's all about my name. It's all about my kingdom. You gotta work it out. How beautiful. How precious. And feminism comes along and says, no, we're gonna disrupt all of that. Everything that God wants, everything that God wants in a marriage, everything that God wants in a family, we're just gonna take that, we're just gonna disrupt the whole thing, and guess what? We're just gonna create new roles for her that are in opposition with God. Feminism is a poisonous fruit. And it has been a poisonous fruit, ladies, for years and years. Because really, at least here, that poisonous fruit came off of a poisonous tree called Marxism. And I'm going to prove to you in the weeks to come, at least here in this country, how the Marxists specifically knew we are going to inject feminism into America. And we're going to bring this country down. And they did it purposely. I'm going to prove it to you. With names. With names. You have women who are equals. They're working with men alongside, alongside, alongside men in ministry, Philippians 4, 3. But the apostles were men. Not all of his disciples were. But the apostles were men. When you get to the pastoral epistles, the elders... Whether you call them elders, shepherds, overseers, men, men. In fact, women are strictly forbidden in Paul's pastoral epistles to ever exercise authority in a congregation over men. Always. And yet we're equals. We're equals, equal value, equal worth, equal spirituality, different roles, different responsibilities. And it has been that way since the garden. In closing, again, it's not an easy message because the message just collides with the culture. With this culture, it just collides with it. It's not like feminism just came around a year or two ago. It's entrenched in the culture. And so the message is abrasive. And yet it comes from God's word. It comes from God's word. I'm trying to get you to see, trying to get you back to the scriptures, back to biblical principles, back to what God wants and what God has always designed. This nation is under judgment. Yes. Without question. And I get it. We have a woman as a vice president, and probably by this time next year, she might even be the president. And people are going to applaud this. And people are going to say, and they're going to applaud it. And what an encouragement. And I'm here to tell you, it's an indictment. It is an absolute embarrassment to this country absolute embarrassment. That is judgment. It has always been. That's how far removed we are. We think it's an accomplishment. 
And God is saying, no, you're under judgment and you don't even know it. The very things, the very things that are that are so precious and so dear that God ordained for you ladies. Eminem, marriage, motherhood. So beautiful. Marriage, motherhood. Those two things. And feminism comes along and says, seriously, you want to be ashamed of those things. How many, I wonder how many seven-year-old girls, 10-year-old girls, 13-year-old girls, how many, if you ask them today, what do you want to be when you when you grow up? What do you want to be when you get out of school? What do you want to be? How many do you think would actually say, I want to be a godly wife. I want to be like Sarah. I want to be like Hannah. I want to be like Mary. I want to be like them. I want to be like Miriam. I, I want to find a godly man who's going to respect me and love me and take care of me. And he's going to help me be everything that I can be for the Lord. And I want to find man that I can do that too. Where I can help him and be a, a corresponding strength with him. So he can be everything that God wants him to be. And we're going to work things out together. And we're going to have children. And we're going to have a beautiful family. That's what I want. Feminism comes along and says, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You need to get a career. You need to be a doctor. You need to be a lawyer. You need to be a, why on earth would you ever want to be a wife or a mother? Be tied down like that. The only way, the only way, ladies, you will ever realize your fullest potential. Being a wife, a godly wife, and a godly mother. Those two come one Two. One, two. One, two. Anything else, career, and if you jump career or anything else over two or over one, the Bible has a word for you. You are a rebel. You are a rebel. We're going to get to lessons where God, in your, and I'll show you in the Word, can God use a single woman? In the scriptures, it's called a virgin. Use a, a single woman, a virgin, for his glory? Yes. A woman that has never bore children? Yes. A divorced woman? Can he use a divorce? Yes. Can he use a widow? Absolutely. And we're going to see all of those. But when you are a wife, when you are a mother, and you don't put those things one, two, and you jump something over that, I'm going to get me a career. I'm going to get me some money. And that career, that doctor, that lawyer, that council person, that president, whatever it may be, that's going to jump over being a wife and a mother. You are a failure. You're a failure. That has never been God's design. Never. I wonder. It's sad. I wonder how many, how many ladies have the nameplate on the door. They got the nameplate on the door. And they've they've got the office. They've got the law practice. They've got the they've got the, the medical facility. They got the doctor's office. They got the whatever it may be. They got the name. They got the promotion. They got the money. They got all of it. You come a long way, baby. They've got the the wonderful office with the beautiful desk and everything, and they've got it up on the highest floor, up in the penthouse, and and everything overlooking the city. And then at four or five o'clock, they grab their briefcase. And they head on down to their BMW or their Lexus or their Mercedes. And they get into the underground garage or whatever. And they drive on home, or whatever. And they come into their gated facility, perhaps. Or maybe the, the penthouse suite in this beautiful condo. And they stick the key in the door. And they got their briefcase. And they turn the lock. And they open it up. And you know what they hear? No. 
nothing except the humming of a refrigerator. You've come a long way, baby. No little feet running to her. No husband welcome home. But you made it, didn't you, baby? You got, you got the position. You got the money. You got that. You got that office. Congratulations. And the days go by. And every day it's an empty, empty condo. And it's an empty house. Yeah, you got your money. And no legacy whatsoever. How many? No. The billboard was, you've come a long way, baby. No. You've been tricked, baby. Been deceived. The serpent came and he deceived you. Father, we come before you and it is so difficult. It's so difficult. Because we're just so far removed, so far removed from your word, that a message like this, it's it really is, it's salt. And it burns. And yet, what happened? What happened? We, we allowed it to happen. Men weren't being the men we should have been. The providers that we should have been. And so much pressure has had to fall on women. Yes. We've allowed a society where, yeah, and oftentimes you got to have two people working just to make ends meet. This has never, ever been your design. Never. And yet this is the situation oftentimes we find ourselves in. But Lord, I, I pray that somebody that's listening either now or going to be listening by recording, by video, so Lord, I, we, we want to get back. We want to get back in your graces. We, the, the money is fine and the home is fine and the house and the, the apartment is fine and the cars are fine and, the, and all of these and the vacations are fine. But there's something missing. There's something missing. And maybe, Lord, again, as we're going to be going on later on in this series, we're going to be looking at how you can use single women in, in, to, to just be a blessing for you and and divorced women and, and widows as well. But Lord, let us never take our eyes off of your kingdom. Really. All that we are, you created us. You created us not for an office chair. You created us to further your kingdom. And we lost our way. We lost our way. Father, I just pray that your spirit would comfort us. I'm sure some have felt the spirit convict as well. But Lord, we truly do want to please you. And we want you to be pleased with us. And we want blessings. We want blessings on our marriages. We want blessings on our homes and our families. On our children as well as our grandchildren. So Lord, as we just, we wind down this lesson, and of course there's more to come. Lord, again, um, may we really just lean on you, not on our own understanding, and understand as well that this culture will fight against you and against your word. And yet, this is your design. And we do want to give you the honor, the praise, and the glory. So we thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. We're going to lay these matters at your feet. And we pray these things, of course, in Yeshua's name.